Welcome to segment number eight on Jesus Keys to Life, the key of virtue. This segment follows upon the last key, which was in order to stay accurate with God, we must keep and do his words. Now, when Jesus started his ministry in 27 AD, he had a tough problem to solve involving that very thing because the Jews had not consistently done what Moses had told them to do, to keep and do the word. Look at Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 2. What happened is, in verse 7, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, so they kept and did the word, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And then in verse 8, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance. Verse 10, And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves down unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. The book of Judges records the consequences to this unfaithfulness. The people of Israel were enslaved again and again. They didn't keep and do. But when they came to their senses and realized their error, God sent deliverers who defeated their captors and then who ruled over Israel until they died. But Israel after that quickly fell away and was enslaved again. And this happened over and over until the time of Samuel, Saul, and David. David defeated all the neighboring countries and his son Solomon completed the temple in Jerusalem around 960 BC and that was the greatest extent of the kingdom of Israel. After that, due to the influences of paganism, the kingdom split into two parts and declined until both halves were carried away into captivity and ultimately in 586 BC the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and all was lost. After 70 years of captivity in Babylon some believers returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple and there was a revival of sorts under Ezra and Nehemiah, Haggai and Zechariah But that did not last. After Malachi, they again fell into so much error that the prophets were murdered. And consequently, God did not send any more prophets until John the Baptist. That was the consequence of not keeping and doing. In that intervening period, the Jewish sages arose and they replaced the prophets and they revised the law by promoting and memorizing oral traditions. One of the main beliefs of the Pharisees who had been infiltrating Judaism since around the time of the Maccabean kingdom was that this oral law was needed to reinterpret the written law because they said circumstances had changed. They also added things to make sure that the written law was not violated. More regulations. For example, the law prohibited eating or possessing leavened food on Passover, beginning at midday on the 14th day of Nisan. The sages added two more hours to this prohibition because they feared that on a cloudy day people would err and eat it after noon. So they added stuff to the word like that. By the time of Herod's rebuilding of the second temple 
and the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, the Pharisees were in firm control of Judaism. However, their version of Judaism was not the same as that was which was given to Moses. They had added a lot of man's rules and doctrines, which achieved equal footing with the written law of Moses. The resulting rules and regulations produced a faith that was impossible to keep. One scholar counted over 600 things per day, which had to be done in order to be a faithful Pharisee. That's impossible. Jesus commented about this in Matthew 15, Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, this oral law? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why have you also transgressed the commandment of God by your tradition? Then he gives an example. Verse 4, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. They had set up a special gift called Corban, C-O-R-B-A-N. And if you look this up, you can get more information on it. And basically, it was a get-out-of-jail-free card. (laughs) <laughs> so once you had given this gift, you were not obligated to honor your father and mother. Well, <laughs> Jesus said they were hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of them, saying, verse 8, This people draws nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So this is what happened when people did not keep and do. Alterations to original Mosaic Judaism had been underway long before the Pharisees arose. The protests of Isaiah and Jeremiah clearly show that unwelcome change was even occurring in their time. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. This is how God approached Isaiah at the very first Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham Ahaz and Hezekiah kings of Judah hear O heavens and give ear O earth for the Lord has spoken I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me The ox knows his owner, and his ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. (laughs) So, Isaiah got revelation, and God said, my people are dumber than oxes, and dumber than asses. Oh my goodness. Because the ox knows his owner, and the ass knows where he lives, but Israel doesn't know that. (laughs) Verse 4, ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Wow. It's just amazing to see. Look at verse 6. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Boy. Verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination on me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I can't tolerate it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. 
Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth, God said. They are trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands in prayer, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. Those were very strong words that Isaiah wrote. Now, to the prophets, it was a very serious matter, and they had been charged by God to confront it. Isaiah had said, the whole head is sick. That meant that the leaders of the congregation were in error. Now, it's one thing to resist error coming from the outside. That's where you expect it to come from. But this attack came from the inside, from their own leaders who had been charged with protecting them. That is much more difficult to withstand. This resulted in the believers going through all the actions of faith with the solemn meetings and the prayers and the sacrifices. It looked okay, but something was very wrong. Their hearts were far from God. These words of the prophets should have awakened those compromisers and get them to keep and do, but it only angered them, and the state of Judaism got worse. Isaiah in chapter 29 says in verse 9, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. This is that idiom of permission. He couldn't help them anymore. They had gone off into the deep end and closed your eyes, and the prophets and your rulers and the seers hath he permitted to be covered. Verse 11, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. The word of God was sealed to them, which men delivered to one that's learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous, incredible, unbelievable work among those people, even an incredible work and a wonder, For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Wow. The key words in that passage are in verse 13, where it says, Their reverence toward me is taught by the precept of men. This documents the inroads of man's religion and theology upon authentic Judaism that was originally given to Moses. Yes, there were revivals during the reigns of the Judean kings, Hezekiah and Josiah, but the words of Jeremiah show that the compromising and influences of man's religion were continually at work. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, and the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, God says, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruits thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Verse 8, The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. 
And the pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. Oh, and walked after things that do not profit. That's how bad it got. Wherefore, verse 9, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Kittim, and see and send unto Kedar. This, that's from the east to the west, figuratively speaking. In other words, look everywhere, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Verse 11, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory into that which doth not profit. No other nation of the ancient world ever voluntarily changed their gods except Israel. Verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, and be very desolate, thus the Lord. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Up until that time, no other nation of the known world had voluntarily changed their gods except the nation which worshipped the true one. What a horrible example. That literally reveals the attack of the adversary that the true God's people the ones he had delivered was so exemplary of a deliverance as the exodus from Egypt that even they had succumbed to the influences of men and compromised. They no longer drank from his unlimited fountain. They sought refreshment from their own broken cisterns, their own religious systems which were flawed and limited. Look at Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, verse 21. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Put your burnt offerings under your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not to your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be to me my people. Walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you, and it may be well with you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined the ear, but walked in the counsels and the imaginations of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Wow. See, all these things happened because they did not keep and do. Things got so bad that the temple fell into disrepair and the book of the law was misplaced and the Jews even forgot how to observe Passover properly. Uh, There was a time that a new king came into power and he commanded that the temple be repaired and when they were doing so they found a lost book of the law and they read it And they were embarrassed because they weren't doing things right. We can see from the stark words of the prophet Jeremiah that things continued to get worse. They were not obeying God. They were doing their own thing. Even after the destruction of Solomon's temple and the 70 year captivity, one would think that they learned their lesson and stopped diluting their faith with the words of men. But after Ezra and Nehemiah's revival and the construction of the second temple, God's people sank into compromise again. And this is even seen in the words of Malachi, the last prophet to write in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and spread dung on your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. (laughs) Wow! Look how bad things got. It's just amazing. 
Verse 7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. So how did this happen? They did not keep and do. Keeping and doing is how to keep error out, like we covered in last session. The established church denies this today, but unfortunately the same thing has happened to our Christian faith. The church fathers brought an error from Greek philosophy into original Christianity and changed it, just like the sages had corrupted Mosaic Judaism with the oral law. A telling example is just look at all the pagan trappings in Christmas and Easter. If our highest holy days have been so infiltrated, what about the rest of Christianity? If we look at history, we can see that both Mosaic Judaism and original Christianity were compromised within a few hundred years, and the erroneous doctrines came from man's speculation and paganism. Today, that has resulted in what is called Orthodox Christianity. Yes, Orthodox Christianity is very different from original Christianity. The Christian compromisings started just as fast as the Jewish ones that we had read about in the book of Judges. Both the Old and New Testament believers ended up teaching for commandments the doctrines of men. This is all because the believers did not keep and do. Look at Jude. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Here it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, Jude says, for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And Jude was written quite early. So even then, all the same kind of compromisings and error were creeping in. How did this happen? Moses explained the whole thing back in Deuteronomy 29. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 29. Because of our curious nature, we humans want to learn about many things, including spiritual things, but there is an important truth to keep in mind. This is summed up at the end of the chapter in Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I'll start here and then work backward into the rest of the chapter. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. See, we human beings have no right to to intrude into the secret things that belong to God. Those concepts are out of bounds. The speculation and teaching on that forbidden information is based on fantasy and guesswork, not fact, and it can't be proven out by practical application, but that which God has actually revealed to us is practical because it says that we may do all the words of this law. So the things that God has told us can be kept and done. This is what we must concentrate upon. Colossians has a similar verse. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, and then also verse 18. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Those things that intrude into the things that are God's. After the tradition of men, that oral law stuff, and the rudiments of the world, all that stuff that comes from the world, and not after Christ. Verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward, 
in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. All that stuff that's God's, that belongs to him in the spiritual realm, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That's where all that stuff comes from. Here's another one in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, in the interlinear, it says, under the systematizing of error, is what the Greek says. Wow. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, into Christ in all things, who is the head, even Christ. So, we should be growing up into Christ and be no more children that are tossed to and fro with all this stuff. See, back in Deuteronomy 29, earlier in the chapter, it explains two outcomes when researchers and teachers violate Deuteronomy 29, 29 and speculate into the secret things that belong to God only. Look at Deuteronomy 29, verse 16. Now, we had read in a previous session about keep and do. Now, this picks up. Deuteronomy 29, verse 16. For you know how we have dwelled in the land of Egypt, Moses said, and how we came through the nations which you passed by and have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. A root that beareth gall and wormwood. One time, Marcia and I had bought plants from a nursery and we had a flower bed in our front yard and all of a sudden we saw this cover crop kind of vine coming up and it just spread and spread and spread and we went to the nursery and we said where did this come from we didn't buy this and they said that well some of their pots of plants that they sold had gotten contaminated with this vine and and we said well it's spreading all over the place how how, how do we stop it because if you just pull it up it's a root it was beneath the ground it kept on coming back up and they said you're going to have to strip the entire plot you're going to have to put down weed killer you're going to have to let it set for a few weeks until everything is dead then you're going to have to get new dirt and put it down and plant everything back in there (laughs) that's how to get rid of a root and so if people don't keep and do then people will either a man or a woman will start there or maybe a family or a tribe will get worse and worse and it will be like a root that bears two things gall and wormwood. Gall is the word rosh in Hebrew. It is the top or head herb, which is opium. That's the word, opium. And wormwood. Wormwood is poison. So those are the two outcomes that happen when people don't keep and do. Teachings that are out of bounds involving conjecture into secret things or pagan doctrines or dealing with topics that are untrue or impractical which cannot help us keep and do will have two outcomes opium or poison I have traced these terms through the Bible and the passages are eye-opening if people don't keep and do they will 
either the wrong teachings will religiously intoxicate people to the point that they will not be rooted in reality, that's the opium, or they will poison and debilitate people to the point where they will not have the heart to do the word, that's the wormwood. I have seen both outcomes. When I tracked these terms through the word, I was astonished at the patterns that I saw. And actually, this very study was the one in which I discovered the concept of signpost words in the Bible. Signpost words are sets of terms and phrases which mark out subjects. Each subject will have its own set. And wherever these terms or phrases cluster are passages which deal with whatever subject you're studying. Sometimes when we do a word study, the word that we are studying does not occur in every passage that deals with that subject. But if we track all the signpost words through the Bible, we will find every passage on that subject. Look at Deuteronomy 29, verse 19. Here's what happens when people do not keep and do and other teachings arise that are violating the directive that God said don't get into the secret things that belong to him verse 19 and it comes to pass when he hears the words of this curse that he doesn't keep and do that he bless himself in his heart saying I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. I'll talk about that in a moment. And the Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from over heaven. Wow. If you track the words Rosh, opium, and wormwood, and the phrase imagination of the heart, through the word, you'll see the portrayal of believers' destruction. It'll record that they'll have a, a false sense of peace. Verse 19, it said, He would bless himself, instead of God blessing him, he would bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace. But that peace was false. And they justified themselves, even though they had strayed from the word and, uh, and God and his truth. And then when destruction comes, it will sweep away the wet with the dry. That adding drunkenness to thirst is a very vivid idiom. That things got so bad, it's like a tornado that whisks everything away, the dry ground and the wet ground. So it takes away the innocent with the guilty because the consequences are so bad. Wrong teaching or impractical teaching, that which has no practical application, or wrongly applied teaching has the potential to infect the congregation so they turn away from the true God to worship false gods. They turn away from the truth because they become intoxicated and puffed up with frivolous, impractical knowledge or because they've been driven into bitter inactivity having their hearts poisoned by knowledge that does not produce proper results taught by elite arrogant or abusive teachers having untrue, ineffective, hurtful, or unprofitable applications. So us teachers, we're solemnly charged to teach the truth, and whatever we teach must be applicable and able to be kept and done. If we don't do so, we're worthless. Practical application will prove whether what is taught is fact or fantasy, or if it is true, the results will confirm it. This picture of what happens when believers don't keep and do is framed by the signpost words gall or opium, wormwood, backsliding, the phrase imagination of the heart, and the concept of false peace. When tracking these terms to the word and seeing where they cluster, a very clear image emerges of a people so filled with impractical head knowledge that they arrogantly think they're serving God when their heart is far from Him. 
That was the condition of things during Christ's time with the Pharisees. They think they have peace and security when actually they're blindly teetering on the edge of destruction. And when it finally occurs, they voice disbelief, wondering, why is this happening to me? This is all because they don't keep and do. For them, church becomes like what is described in Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33, verse 30 through 33. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people are talking against thee. This God's talking to Ezekiel, his prophet, saying, The children of thy people are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that comes forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people comes, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. And lo, Ezekiel, you art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. Oh, wow. And when this comes to pass, and lo, it will come, then they shall know that a prophet hath been among them. You see, this is not entertainment Bible. The word is life. The signpost concept can clearly be seen by following the subject of the word. And when I do that, I make a grid. And I explain this in my work in the word class. But I make a grid like a spreadsheet. And then I notice the occurrence of each signpost word or phrase that goes with that subject, whatever subject I'm studying. I have a chart that I'm going to give you. I'm going to show you that they have hits and more, three or more of the six elements in this subject. And here's a few passages. Deuteronomy 32, 15 and 28 through 33. It says, But Jeshurun, which is a nickname for Israel, waxed fat and clicked. Thou art grown fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. For he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, and they understood this, that they would consider their latter end, how one should chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, opium, and their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. So you see how that term opium and this poison is associated with that turning away from the word. Look at Jeremiah 9. Here's another passage. Jeremiah 9, 12 through 16. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken, that he may declare it? For what the land perishes and is burned up like a wilderness, and none passes through. And the Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore thus saith the Lord hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them the water of gall, opium, to drink. And I will scatter them also among the heathen, with whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them, till I have consumed them. I mean, some of these passages are just chilling. Jeremiah 23, verse 13 and following. 
Here's another one. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people, Israel, to err. I have seen also the prophets of Jerusalem, and horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants as of Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning them, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall, For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not to the word of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord hath said, You shall have peace. And they say unto every one of you that walks after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. But it did. Wow. So that is a picture of what happens when people do not keep and do. God's people forsook the truths that had been delivered unto them and that had delivered them from bondage and substituted their own legalism, which actually put them back in bondage. This signpost word concept is fascinating. Every word study that I have done since about 1988, when Marsha and I learned this signpost word concept, every word study that I have done, I have seen there to be three to seven terms that are used in association with whatever subject that I am studying. And it's fascinating. So when I do a word study, basically it's like I do three word studies simultaneously. And then the other thing that I do is I don't just look at the verse. I look at the whole paragraph where the word that I am studying occurs. And it's fascinating that you see that these associated terms will occur frequently. It's it's just amazing. Now... What I just finished here is the introduction (laughs) to this segment 8. Let's take a short break here, and then let's get back to it. So let's get going after the break again. Now we know how and why men had fallen away from God's truth and substituted their own religion. So... How did Jesus respond to this condition when he started his ministry back in 27 AD? Well, he opened his teaching with the Sermon on the Mount with the solution. He certainly knew that the same forces which had acted upon Moses' teaching to produce the corrupt state of Judaism in his time, would also be acting on his teachings. So, what did he teach that would preserve the integrity of his teaching? He gave the Beatitudes, which I believe he taught specifically to counteract this tendency of man to not keep and do. This is the new paradigm for man. The law of Moses codified what not to do. And the law of love summarized it. And now, the Beatitudes complete the picture by telling what to do. This is the formula in a nutshell. And this is Jesus' key to life, number eight, the key of virtue. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. That opened his mouth is a Semitic idiom. It basically means, in our vernacular, he let them have it with both 
barrels blazing. <laughs> That's how we would say the same thing. He had been working this material ever since he was 12 years old. And he said, I must be about my father's business. Well, for the next 17 years, Jesus prepared for this. And he opened his mouth and he let them have it. (laughs) And he taught them saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, Jesus said. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This is the solution. This is the key. Humility, equanimity, meekness, hunger and thirst for righteousness, mercifulness, pureness in heart, peacemaking, courage to stand for the right, and faith are Jesus' nine virtues. These wonderful attitudes and attributes are the basis for genuine piety, no matter what brand name a believer one may be. They were not something exclusive. They were not only for privileged Pharisees. They are every man's truth and every man's treasure. These, by their very character, spring from the heart, and they can never be legislated or imposed by means of outward ritual. They are inherently spiritual and attractive and healing and liberating in nature. If embraced, these virtues lead inexorably to God. Jesus built his church with a foundation of these wonderful virtues, wholesome mental attitudes. For if one's mental state is right, one's actions will match. So, Jesus encouraged these nine virtues as a solution to prevent what happened in the Old Testament of not keeping and doing. These are mental attitudes which both produce and reinforce proper responses. Therefore, if Jesus featured these so prominently in the introduction of his manifesto, which was the Sermon on the Mount, it was his lesson plan for what he wanted to teach. So if he featured these so prominently, they should figure prominently also in our Christian walk. What is a virtue? Webster's New World Dictionary states, A virtue is general moral excellence, right action and thinking, goodness of character. The opposite of virtues are vices. Both are attitudes, attributes, or habits of heart which are a basis for action. The model human should have virtues but not vices. The beauty and attractiveness of virtues are that they are attitudes and attributes that anyone can attain, no matter who they are, where they came from, or what they have done, or what's happened to them. We just need to decide to attain them, work at it, and persevere no matter where or under what circumstances we've come from. These virtues have inherent power in them to triumph over all. Benjamin Franklin 
was a famous and influential man in science, entrepreneurship, and politics who positively affected the entire world. Well, how did he do that? Was he just born that way? No. When Franklin was 20 years old, he set a personal goal of excellence for himself to do right and to avoid wrongdoing. But he went further in that noble cause than most in that Franklin made a list of virtues which he vowed to keep. And then, second, he also devised a method to achieve his goal. Many of the virtues Franklin chose matched Jesus' list. Now, his method was he decided not to tackle all of these virtues at once, but he decided to concentrate on one virtue each week. And then when he got through his whole list, after so many weeks of going through all his virtues, he would repeat it and take things to a greater level. Now, also, in addition, he, Franklin, made himself a little book with charts that he would use to mark his progress every day. Now, (laughs) I am not going to intrude into your life and make you keep a book of your successes and failures and check it. (laughs) I'm not going to do that. I'm just telling you what Benjamin Franklin did. Virtue made a big difference in how far he got in the world. So how far do you want to go? I am saying that Jesus presented us with a list of virtues which he had thought through and recommended and that if adopted, they would change lives for the better and Hebrew society for the better and the world too. So far in this series... I have presented a lot of eye-opening information. Hopefully, I persuaded you to become a Christian and to believe for and enjoy the benefits thereof. This series may be a turning point in your life. If it has been, where do you want to go now? What do you want to do? Regardless of what vocation or station in life you may aspire to attain, I think that the main benefits we all want are peace, happiness, and purpose. Do you agree? Jesus said then, start here. Cultivate these virtues to achieve your goals. Jesus presented this list of virtues which he indicated were important for the kingdom of heaven, but not only them, for all time. But there are many other virtues. For example, Benjamin Franklin had 13 virtues in his list. Why did Jesus choose to promote these particular nine? To answer that question, I want to put our toe into the pool of man's philosophy just for a moment, for it's interesting to notice what man has thought of virtue throughout time and culture. Jesus chose to summarize his concept of virtue with this listing. Others, both from Eastern and Western cultures throughout time, have chosen different virtues to head their lists. James Stalker, in his book, The Seven Cardinal Virtues, states the following. The idea of cardinal virtues is an exceedingly old one. It occurs in Plato and Aristotle, and from these famous philosophers, it descended to the Greek philosophical schools. From the Greeks, it passed to the Romans, being prominent in the writings of Cicero, and from them, it passed into the fathers of the church. Now, the Greek philosophers chose to catalog virtues into four categories. Temperance, wisdom, justice, and courage. They maintained that all the rest of the human virtues could be derived from these. This is what is meant by cardinal virtues. They stem from these. However, rather than taking our lead from pagan Greek philosophers, I advocate that we consider the list Jesus made. The Greek list implies man's preeminence and achievement. Jesus' list implies man's submission to God. Now, Jesus probably didn't speak or read Greek because his ministry was to the Jews, and he was operating in Judea, 
which was an Aramaic and Hebrew environment that was involved in Semitic culture and thought and centered on the Old Testament scripture. Consequently, Jesus probably derived his list of virtues from the study of the Bible, discussion, observation, contemplation, and revelation. Not a study of Greek philosophy. But there are some compelling similarities. Jesus was not operating in a vacuum. He lived in a culture where believers discussed the scriptures amongst themselves and where certain people who had intellect and ability gravitated to centers of learning to study at the feet of reputed scholars. Consequently, everything that Jesus taught was not totally new. He certainly did put his personal and profound stamp on what he learned, characterizing his presentations in his own pragmatic, deep, spiritual, and compassionate manner. But what he taught definitely had a historical and philosophical context for the times in which he lived. This is very interesting. Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, was located near a major trade route, the Via Maris, Roman superhighway. So its residents definitely were exposed to foreign ideas brought in by the caravans and discussed around the nightly campfires of the caravanserai, or cons. These were the equivalent of our motels. So Jesus was living near a truck stop. (laughs) I know what that is like, for there was a truck stop across the street where I grew up. It was a melting pot of people from all over the United States. Now, the Jerusalemites would say, Oh, you are from Nazareth. I know about those people. That stigma was exposed by that slur, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They were referring to the more open-minded thinking of that area as compared with the more conservative, legalistic thinking stemming from Jerusalem. Therefore, from Jesus' discussions or from contact with travelers, because his profession as a carpenter would be fixing the, the wooden equipment in the caravans, Jesus certainly would have been exposed to information circulating in Palestine coming from the Jewish philosopher Philo, who was also in the same generation as he. Philo, who lived in Alexandria of Egypt, wrote about virtue, incorporating the elements of Greek philosophy into Hebrew philosophy. But he added, the fundamental virtue is goodness, and from it proceeded the other four virtues, prudence, courage, self-control, and justice. Jesus probably improved upon Philo's Greek list, but there are indications that Jesus' list of virtues had its roots in Semitic thought, not Greek thought. He was an Eastern man and had an Eastern list, not a Western one. His list did contain four categories which were similar to Philo and the Greeks, but he headed his categories with different virtues that he esteemed as cardinal. And the differences are remarkable when compared to their Greek counterparts. He also added more categories which brought in a more spiritual Semitic flavor to this concept of virtue. The Greek list was dispassionate and intellectual, but Jesus' list was different. It was practical. For example, Jesus headed the Greek cardinal listing of courage, that category, with persecuted for righteousness sake instead. See, to endure a persecution for the sake of being right certainly requires courage. And it is a kind of bravery that is better because one could be wrongly emboldened with courage to commit evil. So being brave enough to be persecuted for righteousness sake is a better kind of courage. There's nothing virtuous about just doing evil and being brave to do that. Jesus also chose to head the man's justice category with the virtue of being a peacemaker. See, this truly puts a different twist on that because we can infer from this that the effect of true justice must be peace. So, the Greek virtues were abstract, 
But Jesus' virtues were practical, something his audience could conceive of more easily. So you can see that by comparing justice with peacemaking, temperance with being pure in heart, courage with the, the tenacity to endure persecution. You can see the former seed is a concept, but the latter that Jesus had is a result. It's practical. That's Greek thinking versus Semitic. Abstract versus something tangible. Jesus wanted to reach people's hearts and motivate them with something tangible that could have results. So, let's take our toll back out of the pool of philosophy and get back to talking about the benefits of building virtue in our lives. Virtues are attractive. Do you want to have people respect you? Do you want to have a genuine and valuable relationship with others? Then I recommend building the positive character traits of virtue in your life. Virtues are also basic qualities necessary for our well-being and happiness. When we have virtue, we will attract others and form fulfilling relationships. We will more easily achieve goals and be fulfilled and find happiness Once we commit ourselves to building virtues, we become less influenced by the world and more focused and spiritual. And if we persevere, we will be more successful. Opposite every one of the virtues are vices. So the process is out with the bad, in with the new. We re-re-re-renew our minds. And consistency is the key to building virtue in our lives. Also, it cannot be conforming. It has to be transforming. We cannot be forced by legalism to put virtue on in our lives because the whole process will be false. It has to come from within by our own free will, by us working on it. So that's why I'm not going to be checking lists. (laughs) Okay? Then that is transforming. And so if we, by our free will, stop enjoying vices and concentrate on building and enjoying virtues, we will make progress. Because it takes the same effort for both. So how much do you want to excel? The best virtues are Jesus' list. We'll see more about their effects in future segments. When we cultivate Jesus' list in our lives, we definitely will develop genuine, godly character and live acceptable to God. That is why I call the Beatitudes Faith 101. It is so basic and fundamental that it is applicable no matter what brand name us believers are. Anyone who believes in God can work to bring out these inherently spiritual characteristics in themselves, then everything else, pure, good, and godly, will flow from these. So, I am now going to go through this list, but instead of just saying, do this, I'm going to explain in detail what each one is and how to build them. I went out on the internet, I looked at psychological web pages and biblical web pages and from the consensus I have the following humility the first one Jesus chose to head his list the first beatitude with humility now Matthew 5 3 says blessed are the poor in spirit but according to George Lamsa who's an Aramaic scholar poor in spirit was an idiom for humility. To be poor in spirit or ego or pride is to be rich in humility. So many good things spring from a humble attitude. To humble oneself before God begets reverence, worship, and obedience. Pride was the first sin when Lucifer was lifted up with it. And then he he tried to be like God. Then he used the same trick on Adam and Eve. So it's quite fitting that the first cardinal virtue, according to Jesus, is the opposite to the vice of pride. Now, in this selfish world, humility has gotten a bad rap as a quote-unquote monkish (laughs) attribute, like monks. But it actually is not devaluing oneself. 
the Psychology Today website speaks of humility as, quote, while some misunderstand humility as low self-esteem or self-denigration, a proper conception of this virtue has both self-regarding and other regarding components. The humble person keeps their accomplishments, gifts, and talents in a proper perspective. They have self-knowledge and are aware of their limitations as an individual and as a human being. But humble individuals are also oriented toward others. They value the welfare of other people and have the ability to forget themselves as well when appropriate. So, humility is a valuable virtue when working with others. Now, I normally don't cite Wikipedia, but in this case, it offers an astute definition as, quote, humility is the act of lowering one's self in relation to others, or conversely, having a clear perspective and therefore respect for one's place in context. So, it actually means being comfortable with one's station in life relative to others. So, in other words, if someone is a private, they must accept that, for it helps them perform with respect to others. But, the same is essential for a general, for it helps them keep from the trap of feeling infallible. C.S. Lewis wisely stated that humility is, quote, not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. (laughs) The Greek word for humility in the Bible is tapenos, which means a low condition, lowly in spirit or humble. It is interesting that Jesus also heads up another of his main categories of virtue with meekness. Now, one would think that humility and meekness are synonymous. In English, they're close, but they actually are further apart if we consider their roots in the Old Testament. The trait which the Bible emphasizes in humility is obedience. When we humble ourselves before God to obey Him, quite a few good things flow from that. Pride is the opposite vice, being overly self-reliant, egotistical, not cooperating with God, but arrogantly choosing your own paths. For many, humility may be hard to develop because it has to start from a recognition that we're not always right. But if we consider the benefits, it's worth it. Look at Proverbs. has a bunch of good information about these virtues. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. There's the pride side. But the Lord ponders the hearts. And he knows what's going on. Proverbs 22.4 By humility and reverence of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. So look at the benefits of humility. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5b and 6. It says, Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace, divine favor, to the humble. So if you're humble, you're going to get divine favor from God. Verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So, that's a great promise. We put on humility by recognizing God's supremacy in our lives. We admit that we have made mistakes and are thankful that He's forgiven us through the sacrifice of His Son. We forsake pride and obey the Word. But it is also humble to accept what God has done for us and the vocations He has called us to and to live up to the worth of our new man. That's obedience also. It is to know our place. Now, not the place to which we have been forced, but the place to which we have genuinely attained. So if you're a private, then we act 
in context, that context. But if we're a captain or a general, then we act in that context. It's humble to do both. It's not to let others walk all over you. It is to walk commensurate with your calling. So it is possible to be assertive of your rights and your station and humble at the same time. Now, I went out on the internet and looked at all these different pages at some of the ways to build humility. Some suggestions are be grateful for what you have. Another one, don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. See how that would work with a context of helping and being in your context with others? Realize that there are steps toward your goals and earn each step. Be patient. God will exalt you in due time. Resist prideful thoughts. So those are some suggestions on how to build humility. The next virtue is blessed are they who mourn. The second virtue on Jesus' list is very thought-provoking. What do we do when calamity strikes? Do we explode or become angry or judgmental or vindictive? Do we implode into a ball of grief forever? Or should we just go to God for help and mourn? Go through the grieving process. We are and we live in an evil world and we're not in control of it despite our best efforts. We spend much of our lives trying to carve out a secure life and it can be destroyed in seconds. When calamity occurs, there's two general reactions. We can either blame God or run to Him for help. Sometimes there is someone or something we can blame, but in other circumstances, we were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Word says the devil attacks without cause. Sometimes it's not our fault. We just were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The correct response in times of calamity is to go to God to mourn and heal and to pray and believe for aid. Other reactions will poison us. When calamity strikes, it's virtuous to possess equanimity. So this virtue is equanimity. It is the even-temperedness to handle an event in a level-headed, healthy, constructive way, and to not allow the negatives to further poison us by means of our improper words or actions. This category definitely imparts an Eastern spiritual flavor to Jesus' list of virtues. When Satan attacked Job twice, His frustrated wife reacted in an improper way and told Job to just curse God and die. But Job was virtuous and he reacted differently. In Job chapter 1 verse 20, it says, Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and worshipped. He didn't complain. He washed his mouth. He worshipped. And said, Naked came I out from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, sin, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. See, verse 21 contains that Hebrew idiom of permission. Remember, God is good all the time. He doesn't cause evil. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. He had permitted things to be taken away because Job had left the door open because of his fear. Remember what we taught in the key of believing? Fear is the opposite, and fear works just like believing does. Job 3.25, Job said, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. So, he had left the door open and the adversary took advantage of it. So, But Job handled the situation with equanimity, with level-headedness. He watched what he said and did. 
Now, Satan's been teaching our Western culture to respond differently with violence and revenge when evil or calamity strikes. The world instructs that it's admirable to strike back. Our news media gravitates to this. They make it the main attraction of the newscast. Our movies are chock full of violence. When we finish watching them, we feel like we've been on an emotional roller coaster. (laughs) Is that really entertainment? Or is it actually emotional abuse? (laughs) Some genres of our music are full of violence. Our kids recite them like poetry. Our video games are teaching our children the same. But even worse, instead of passively witnessing the violence, our children participate. And they do it over and over in the game for hours. This definitely and absolutely is training them to respond to stimuli in an ungodly fashion. I mean, what happened, what else, what happens with anything else that you do repeatedly? Now, you know, the video game manufacturers will disagree with this, but what do you expect? They're simply having the same corporate denial as the cigarette companies used to have before they were exposed. So, yes, there is a need for an emotional response when evil happens. We do need to release that negative energy. It's not good to bottle it up. For it will certainly come out somewhere, some way, and usually uncontrolled or unintended. But instead, we should redirect that energy toward good. Star athletes know how to do that. They know how to excel in their sport and redirect the energy of negative things into positives. We can do the same. We can release it to God. We can pour out our heart and souls to Him and cast all our cares upon God and then He will direct us into wholesome action in response to the calamity so that we can overcome the evil with good. Now, rage is the opposite vice to equanimity. We can seethe with anger or ascribe blame or harbor grief and mistakenly carry that burden for months or years or a lifetime. Or we can give it to God to properly handle the situation. Once wounded, is evil supposed to affect us forever? No. We can heal and there is a process. Now, it takes time. We can't make people do this. They have to do it in their own time. So, equanimity or rage, what do you think is right? There is a grieving process implied by the word mourn. We can go through that and those stages of that with dignity in order to come to terms with an attack or a loss and ultimately cope, forgive, and heal emotionally. But ultimately, good is designed to overcome evil. So, it's beneficial for us to get on board with that process. So, if you read about Job's experience in Job chapter 38 through 42, it shows how God helped him through all the steps of grief. God counseled Job. So this documents that often a counselor's help is needed. We need to build this virtue in our lives by disciplining our thinking and speech and reactions to evil when it attacks We should make it a habit to go to God in prayer when we need aid. And then we should patiently wait, humbly maintaining our faith for deliverance until we get it. Remember, in the end, God will overcome all evil with good and we shall see it. So, ways to build equanimity are... Learn how to stay your mind upon God. Manage your emotions. Think twice before you speak or act. Practice moderation in all things. Another suggestion, develop a good prayer life. And learn how to intercede for those who have offended you. That one there was one of the hardest things for me to learn because of my background. 
But the greatest example of this is when Jesus was on the cross and he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, when we pray for those people, we're not praying against them. We're not praying for lightning bolts to hit them. We're praying for God to convert them. See, that's what we do. And if we keep that healthy thought in our mind when we pray, that prayer is therapeutic. The next one is meekness. The next pivotal virtue in Jesus' list is meekness. Humility and meekness are close in meaning, but there is an important difference in connotation. The meaning for the Greek the Greek word is prautes, and that's translated meekness. It includes gentleness, mildness, and friendliness. But meekness is not weakness or having been humbled by circumstances. Numbers 12.3 states that Moses was the meekest man upon the earth in his day. Huh. Well, Moses definitely was no pushover. He had fearlessly gone face to face with Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the earth. So, there's nothing mild-mannered or weak about that. So, there has to be something more here, which is lacking in our Western understanding of this concept. If we look at the examples of the use of the word meekness in the Bible, we'll discover its scriptural meaning and application. So, James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, or abundance of naughtiness, or evil, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So, meekness allows us to receive instruction from God. NFL football players must be meek to succeed in their game. They must be coachable, even though they're fierce enough to knock someone to the ground on the field of play. So, meekness is, to, is not to be confused with weakness. To me... The the key to understanding meekness is that it emphasizes openness and receptivity to the things of God. To be meek is to be teachable, to be coachable, to not argue with God. Look at Psalm 25, verse 9. It says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Both of those things are tremendous to learn and we need to be teachable coachable the opposite vice to meekness is arrogance being a know-it-all some things to build meekness are realize that once you stop learning you're going backward another thing realize there are others who may be better at things than you that'll keep you meek (laughs) Develop good reading habits. And double check what you believe. That's being teachable. Try new things. Be willing to better yourself. Ask others questions. And then consider their opinions on things. All these help you to keep an open mind and be teachable, meek. Develop good listening habits. <laughs> So, there, all these techniques are things that can be looked up on the internet to see suggestions how to do these. But this is how to develop these virtues in our lives because they definitely all are beneficial. The next virtue is hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is fascinating. This involves seeking truth, but it's it's more than that. You see... We can have access to all the natural and spiritual knowledge, but if we don't want the right knowledge enough to pursue it, then it's still worthless. We have to build optimism and hunger and thirst for righteousness and truth. The the vice that is opposite to this is apathy. We don't care. It doesn't. We're not going to do anything. We're lazy. 
you know, it's been so bad, it's not going to get any better. No, you have to have optimism to hunger and thirst for a good result. Often, people put up with negative things and have tolerated them for so long they become used to them and the thought of ever getting anything better fades away. And so they willingly stay entrapped. So this is why Jesus knew that hunger and thirst were key concepts. So, how hungry are you? How far are you willing to go to really get what you came to church for? Look at Matthew 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness and the promises, for they shall be filled. The word filled in the Greek is kortazo, which means to eat to one's fill, to be satisfied. In other words, it is to satiate our appetite. Now, everyone can get a different amount then, depending upon how hungry they are. So this is both an invitation and a promise. I really think that few want to be wrong, but some people do have a stronger desire to be right than others. The devil has constructed the world that to make it easy to fail and to become apathetic. He's the king of entropy, disorder. Therefore, it takes effort to live in the world and to be right and to stay right. Some people are willing to put out that effort and to be correct, and others have just given up to go with the flow. So, how hungry are you? How much do you want to be right? If you keep on at it, you'll get there. Have you succumbed and resigned yourself to be just conformed to the world and go with the flow? There's an example of this in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 2. There was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of of withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, this, the rest of this verse to the end of verse 4 is not in many texts where it says an angel went down to a certain season in the pool and troubled the water whithersoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had now that's strange verse 4 is strange because we've learned that the principles we need to believe verse 4 is spiritual lotto <laughs> So, and it's not in many texts. So, but verse 5. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that state, he said to him, Do you have the will to be made whole? See, this poor man had been infirm for 38 years. But Jesus didn't merely sympathize with him. Instead, Jesus got right to the point and asked him, Do you still have that willpower to get whole? Do you still have it? See, we obviously have needs, but do we have the wants? Would you still want to be healed after 38 years of having some condition? Jesus helped and inspired this man to muster the desire to fight again and get to the place where he could believe and receive Deliverance. I hope that these teachings will help you in the same situations. So, the key question is, how hungry are you? How thirsty are you? Have you given up? There's a cartoon that we probably all have seen, and that is of a heron trying to swallow a frog. The frog is in the heron's mouth, but The frog has his hands on either side of the mouth, choking the heron. And the caption at the bottom says, don't ever give up. Well, Jesus and I concur. If Satan has us in his grasp, grasp, keep choking that bird. (laughs) Keep contending. He ultimately will have to spit us out. The key is, how hungry are you? How thirsty are you? Get that righteousness and truth that we're believing for. Get that deliverance. And don't let anything or anyone stop us. 
Don't ever give up, just like Abraham when we learned that. When dark clouds cover our skies, remember one thing. The weather is sunny and fine, only a short distance away. Straight up. (laughs) Just keep your thoughts on heavenly things and get your deliverance. Hunger and thirst after righteousness and you shall be filled. So, ways to build optimism and positive expectations are surround yourself with positive people. Oh, that's so beneficial. Then, confess positive things and build that habit like we saw in Renewing the Mind. Habits are things that everyone has and can build. So, we just have to get busy doing it and we will get the result and usually it only takes a few weeks. So, build habits of confessing positive things. And then, another thing, don't accept evil. Always look for deliverance and then take the appropriate action. Uh, Another thing that might be good would be to limit or eschew negative entertainment like movies or music that is negative. Why pump that stuff in yourself if you're trying to get out of it? So, the next virtue is mercifulness. This next virtue is the product of the influence of Hebrew culture. Uh, there is, it's a cruel world out there, and stuff happens. Sometimes people fail and suffer injury because of something they did. But other times they suffer calamity because they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, have you ever heard the phrase, There but for the grace of God go I? That's something to think about. When you see somebody else's calamity, do you turn your eyes away? The Jews were supposed to reach out and to be merciful in those circumstances. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite had an opportunity to help the wounded man in the parable, but they refused, and it was the Samaritan, a half-Jew, who finally did. But if you lack wisdom on what to do in a situation where it's possible to have mercy on someone, ask God. He'll tell you what to do. I remember one time when I was writing my book on the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, I encountered a woman who had a need. So I just asked God what to do. She needed a ride, and, you know, usually I, you know, I double check about that kind of thing she needed to ride so I said I could give you a ride and then as we were riding she actually needed some money so I decided to give her $25 and 5 mile ride where she needed to go and then on the way I spoke the word to her and told her I was a minister and I found out she actually was not totally destitute but she was getting some aid I also discovered that she was a believer, so I encouraged her. And she offered to pay me back at the end of the month when she got her disability money from the government. But I I said, no, no, because if you pay me back, all I'm going to get is $25. But if I let God pay me back, I'm going to get what I actually need. So I dropped her off and said goodbye. Within one half hour, I received a phone call which brought me $600 worth of work. At that time, I was doing computer repair, and each contract included a little bit for transportation. But I got a set of work orders all at the same address, but they all still had all of that bundled in. So I got $600 worth of work within half an hour, and I knew I'd done the right thing. It was God paying me back. So, when you are in a circumstance where we can show mercy, then we have to develop a a sense of what to do, and God will teach us. Um, We need to eschew selfishness and judgmentalness. These are the vices, they're the opposite, and endeavor to share with others. So, don't just walk by people who have need. Try to help them. Engage them in conversation. In the least... Their situation is an open invitation and a clear opportunity to witness to them 
or to minister to them. I mean, after a while, we'll develop the common sense, the spiritual sense, to know when to give a fish or teach how to fish. Or when we offer to pray for them, that often separates the wheat from the chaff. Where if, they're, if they genuinely have a need or they're just put on a show, then you know, just do what God says to do. We can never allow ourselves to become so aloof or hurt or self-centered that we refuse to be merciful, loving, or charitable. That opens many doors for God to bless us back. So even if you are hurt, never stop giving, never stop trying to help, never allow anything to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Some things to do to build mercifulness is put yourself in someone else's shoes. Have empathy. Practice kindness. No strings attached. Do not be judgmental. Another good thing. Engage fully with others when you're talking to them. Look at them when you speak and smile. So that's that virtue. The next one is pureness of heart. This next category reflects a central team here in our faith. This virtue implies discipleship, balance, and maturity. It's a genuineness, a purity of heart that's cultivated over time. Now, the Greeks thought temperance to be the most desirable in this category. However, to be pure in heart is more God-centered and moral than mere generic self-control, therefore more worthy of leading this category. The book of Proverbs often extols this kind of virtue. The opposite, the vice, in this category is to be undisciplined. Proverbs 11.20 They that are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. And there's a lot of benefits if you delight God. To be upright in your way implies more than just casual thought. A way involves repeated actions. It's a pathway. Proverbs 11.3 The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them. So, part of this process of developing this virtue must be responding properly when we make mistakes and need reproof and correction. Well, no one's perfect, and this is life. And we need to have a proper attitude towards receiving reproof. Don't resist or give excuses. Learn from it. Receive it. Take it to heart. We must realize that the person who is giving it to us is actually trying to help us. We build the virtues in this category by accepting the reproof and instruction and then deciding to learn from it and follow it. All kinds of benefits flow from this. Proverbs 14.30 A sound heart is life of the flesh, but envy is rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 16.17 The highway, it's not just a pathway, it's more. It's a highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keeps his way preserves his soul. Some of the things that will help in this virtue to develop it is share quality time with good people to learn how to be pure at heart. Make a list of things you want to improve. Now, this is a private list, okay? This is just for you. Replace bad habits with good ones. Another one is pursue altruism. Altruism is to do good without strings attached. Then, another way to build pure heartedness is make your goal, make a plan, and then take steps to achieve it. It doesn't happen automatically. There's effort for every one of these, but they're all worth it. The next virtue is peacemaking. The Greeks esteemed justice to be the king in this category, but justice without God is shallow. Jesus, on the other hand, puts peacemaking at the head of this category. Because peace is the real goal of true justice. Earlier, we considered the virtue of equanimity to help heal people from evil or loss. 
We also dealt with mercy that was essential to heal people from physical and mental injury. But this virtue of peacemaking entails caring enough to get involved with people to try to heal them from conflict so that justice can be wrought and peace enjoyed. This is an admirable trait, but many don't have the patience or the love to shoulder this burden and wade into the midst of a conflict between people and listen them out and perceive the keys that will lead to resolution and mediate issues to a successful resolution. But it's worth it. As we saw earlier, another facet of this virtue is to help believers make peace with God. The vice in this is just to put up with clamor instead. So if you want to build this virtue, treat all parties with respect, develop good listening skills so that you can understand what the problem is, make sure you diffuse the emotion and promote getting to the facts, find what people want, and then present a biblical solution. So we just have a couple more to do. The next one, the next virtue is enduring persecution for righteousness sake. This eighth virtue involves standing up for being right, even though it may bring on persecution. That's better and more admirable than mere courage. Do you see the God-centered aspect that Jesus was promoting when he chose this as a category head? It's virtuous to bravely take a stand for what is right. Now, this virtue is an extension of our own personal integrity. If we will habitually do and think what is right, then we will notice when situations around us are off the standard. It's interesting, in the workplace today, many people compartmentalize their business and they will not intrude into what is someone else's responsibility, even though it affects the whole company. One of the habits that I have is I am proactive. And when I see something that is awry, then I bring it up. Now, I'm not a busybody, and and I don't tell people what to do all the time. I have a very helpful and team-oriented attitude at work in my secular job. And so when I see something that is a pattern that needs attention, I'll bring it up. I'll say, well, did you see this or did you see that? And then I'll leave it. I'm not going to push it. But proactivity is a good trait to build, and it takes being observant, see issues, and then be brave enough to speak up. Psalm 26 talks about walking in mind integrity and I have a lot written on that in the repetition paper and a few others I'll leave that for you for your study Psalm 26 shows how to build integrity so we can stand up for the truth and speak up when necessary that is a healthy outgrowth from maintaining right standards in our own life The world fights against this with political correctness, (laughs) which is an oxymoron. That's something that's mutually exclusive, political and correctness. They present us with only two choices, saying if we disagree with someone, we're being hateful. Well, that's not true. And if we agree with them, then it's loving. Well, I mean, if you really hate them, you wouldn't want to help them. And if you really love them, then you would, and you'd speak up. See, so that presentation of only two choices is not true. How how many situations are we in where there's only two choices? There's a multitude of choices. And they just try to center us in on that. Another excuse is, if someone's doing something that's not bothering you, why should you get involved? <laughs> well, put it this way. If someone is sick of a communicable disease and they're not getting treatment, what is going to happen ultimately? It's going to spread. That's how you counter if somebody's doing something that's not bothering you, why get involved? Well, ultimately, it is going to affect you. But sometimes in this world, we suffer for doing right. Well, First Peter talked about that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, 
Sometimes we get resistance when we speak up. Well, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it when you're buffeted for your faults that you take it patiently? Well, you ought to. But if when you do well and suffer for it, take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So in this context where you get accused for doing something right, well, don't sin and don't have guile, don't try to soft sell it. Stand up for what's right. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So, if we stand up and get persecuted for righteousness' sake, there's reward there. Look at Psalm 62. Psalm 62 contains a repetition that is applicable in this circumstance. Psalm 62, verse 1. Truly my soul waits upon God, From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Verse 3. How long shall you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall you be as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. There's that repetition, verse 2 and verse 6. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. See, this is how we deal with that situation where we need God's rock, where we need His defense. Just stand and He'll take care of us. Psalm 91 is a great psalm in this context. I'll let you read that on your own so because we're running out of time here. But Psalm 91.14 It says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So, if we stick out our neck for God to correct something that's not right, don't be afraid of man's reactions. Put yourself in God's hands and watch Him go to work for you. The front line in any battle is where the power is brought to bear. And if we're willing to stand up for what is right, we definitely will see His power manifested. Now, I'm not saying be like a Pharisee. The Pharisees were always pointing out mistakes that others made. But that's not what I'm talking about. The difference is that we practice what we preach and we utilize wisdom to deal with things when we see evil. So, like in Galatians 6, if you see someone overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual. So, that is a revelation demanding situation. One time, Jesus uh, reproved Peter with a look. (laughs) So, there's many different ways to reprove when you see something wrong and God will tell you how to do it. So this is not just being right. We are to be right and we have to have the wisdom to pick our fights and speak up and do so in an appropriate way when the situation is spiritually right and profitable and necessary. So if we get resistance or pressure or persecution because we take a stand, well, that's for righteousness sake, not because we mishandled the situation and did not reprove correctly. And that's very important. It has to be for righteousness sake. Sometimes people react to resistance or persecution expecting God to reward or protect or honor them when the problem is actually because they are in error. Well, in that case, 
deliverance necessitates acknowledging their mistake and asking for forgiveness. Just do right and let God work. And if we suffer for persecution for righteousness' sake, then expect divine help. The last virtue is faith. This is the crown jewel of the Beatitudes. It's faith 101. All of these virtues together make up faith. They were to be the traits of Jesus' church, and this was his solution to the legalism that had repressed the believers for generations and the inroads of not keeping and doing. This was his counterculture. And if the believers espoused these virtues, they would escape the grasp from those who had dominated them. Now, I talk about faith in another session, but another aspect of this virtue is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Look at Proverbs 25. We'll just have a few more scriptures here. Proverbs 25, verse 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. (laughs) Wow. You have to depend on it and it hurts you. That's not how to be faithful. Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. So faithfulness means taking all the steps one by one, doing it the right way. Matthew 25 is a great scripture about faithfulness. Matthew 25, verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who had called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his ability, and straightway he took his journey. Then he that hath received the five talents went and traded with the same and made other five talents. So he had ten. And likewise he that had received two, and he gained another two, so he ended up with four. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest to me five talents, and behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22, He that received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained another two talents beside them. His Lord said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he that had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not strawed, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, here is what is thine. His Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So being faithful is to utilize what you've been given and just keep on utilizing it. There's consistency is the main trait of faithfulness. So, to build this faithfulness is to build a habit of keeping commitments. I know people don't like to keep commitments in our society, but it's very important that if you do, then you will build faithfulness. Keep promises, even if we could offer a valid excuse. Make your word your bond. So, these are the virtues of faith that Jesus espoused 
And if we build these in our life, then Christianity takes on a practical standpoint. It's not just intellectual, do you know the doctrine, but do we keep it and do we do it? The cure for the opium and for the wormwood. See, the goal for all of this is to end up matching your mental, physical heart with your spiritual heart, like in the renewed mind section. And everybody has to start somewhere. So the best thing to do is to pick the one virtue that you need the most and to work on it. And then you can pick up the other virtues. Benjamin Franklin had his method where he worked on one virtue a week. He had 13 virtues. So every 13 weeks, he would start out all over again and try to improve on where he left off. And now that method may be something that people can do, but I don't want to end up getting into people's business and checking their methods and all that. No, this is something that if we pick out the thing we need to work on the most and then we work on it, we're going to see results. And those results are going to lead us to God and to lead us into deliverance because this is the genius of Jesus on display. That is why he chose these nine. They're all therapeutic. They're designed to lead us to God. Building these virtues is a roadmap on how we can keep and do and then we will receive the benefits thereof. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God bless you.